From a defabricated solar power garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA, this is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, the top 10 reasons you should probably not have your 4th of July fireworks celebration in your car. And now, the podcast host who only sets off fireworks in appropriately confined public restrooms, Pete Dominic. Thank you, Pete Cole. Always great advice and happy Independence Day, folks. Happy 4th of July. Are you off? Are you celebrating? Why are you listening? I am happy that you are. I've got something very special, a couple of very special things for you on today's show. My favorite historian, Kenneth C. Davis, joins me to talk about the history of Independence Day. We also talked about the Civil War, specifically Gettysburg, because that battle took place over these three days, July 1st through 3rd, 1863. We talked about the history of strongmen and authoritarians and what's happening now. Always an amazing conversation. I think you're really going to love it. But this week, I am also obsessed with fireworks and hating on them. I think it's great to go to a fireworks show at the town park or whatever. But when people are sending them off their house, it's just it's too much. I'm very happy that it's pouring rain tonight. So my neighborhood is not in a war zone as it usually is. I'm sure that'll change tomorrow and the days after when they didn't get to use them on their their rain date, whatever it is. But as a result of this, it's a family thing, the kind of disdain and fear of fireworks. So I reached out to my dad And I asked him to be a special correspondent. I sent him out to a fireworks store, one of those pop-up tents, literally, that's in the parking lot of malls in New York State. I don't know how it is where you are. So we sent the special correspondent, my dad, Chisel D, to a fireworks store. He takes us inside, tells us some of the items that are there, and asks some questions to the guy running the place. It gets super awkward and hilarious, in my opinion. So let's take a trip into the fireworks store with my dad right now. <laughs> That's right, Pete. This is your reporter on the scene, and I decided that I was going to do uh, something this afternoon I've never done before, and that is to go into a fireworks store and actually look around Because basically, I had nothing else to do this afternoon. So I figured uh, it is July 3rd. It's the eve of the 4th when everybody's going to be blowing up things. So I decided to stop in and see what it's all about. So I went down to Denny's in the parking lot directly in front of what is basically an abandoned mall. And there is a uh, big tent set up with lots of fireworks and big signs that say 70% off and discounts for veterans. And when I walked inside, I saw two really burly guys selling fireworks to kids. Little kids, like seven-year-old kids were in there with their fathers buying boxes and boxes of things that explode. So let's head inside. Some nice stuff here, some sparklers. Are sparklers. $12. And here's a, uh, here's a one that looks like a bottle. This is a bottle of sparks. Here's, uh, here's something. Piccolo Pete's. You'd like that. No idea what it does. And you got some little thing. Here's a little rocket. $13. You know, it's like a, looks like a little tiny rocket. I don't know what you do with this stuff. Here's some flares. And then uh, $17.99, you can get some pink diamonds. And here's something that's uh, nice. It's an inferno. It's a cone. I think this is what almost blew your grandfather's hand off. It's $18.99, so it's not $19 at least. And uh, you put this on the ground and you light it, and if it doesn't go off, don't go near it, because it'll explode, I found out. Here's a uh, mad dog fountain with a picture of a very angry dog on it. And they're on sale for $30. How could it be on sale if they only sell them like four days a year, I wonder? Oh, look at this, $34.99. Bomb pop. You know, you don't know what this stuff does. I don't, oh, this is down from fifty nine ninety nine, which it never was, to forty nine ninety nine. And here's the one that says top seller pyro pack, which they all should be labeled pyro pack. But what 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 have you got here that really shoots up in the air? What do you I mean, got? So all these makes a bounce. huge explosion up in the yeah, air. Yeah, there's no, you got? We don't have any of that. You're None of that. Show, no, you're gonna have to no. Pennsylvania. But it, 
Got to go to Pennsylvania to get yeah. that? Why? Because they can't sell it in New York. They consider it a projectile. Well, it's it would illegal. be, yeah. Oh, none of these shoot off in the air? I mean, they shoot off in the air, but it's like a fountain. It's not like you're shooting a mortar. You know? Yeah, you gotta have. You don't have any of them? No. No bottle bombs? Zero. No mortars? Can't do it. What, it just sparkles? Pretty much. Pops, colors. And doesn't go up in the air? I mean, no, sir. Yeah. Can you throw them? Can you, like, take one and just fling it with, a like, yeah, a probably last? Could. Probably just tip, put it in your hand, light it, and go? This is this type of thing? Oh, this is over on that. TNT, too. yeah, that's okay. the sparkleberry. What does that do? Oh, it's going to go show. Yep. Oh! Oh, that's good. That's what they all do. Looks like intense heat. Yeah, it's just like that. Like just nothing. Uh, it goes off in the Oh, sky. so if I go to Pennsylvania, but it's too late for that. Yeah. So that, how long does that go off for? Uh, a minute and a half. How long? How much is that one? Twenty-seven ninety-nine. Oh, 28 bucks for a minute and a half of great pleasure. <laughs> all right. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> look it over here again. And here's another uh, peg. Is these all, none of these, they don't take off. They just are on the ground. And... Uh, Here's here's one uh, for two ninety nine ninety nine with a no dud guarantee. If this doesn't go off, can I bring it back and you'll just give me my money back? It says no dud no dud guarantee. Huh? If, if one thing, if something doesn't go off, can I bring it back? Oh, are you gonna be here? Uh, if we're not it's July 4th, tomorrow. Are you going to be here? We're, I mean, we're going to be here till 8 o'clock. When? Till 8 o'clock. Tonight? Tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. If anything tonight, doesn't tomorrow. go off in the package, you just have to send off. Uh, what if? You just have to send in uh, something to the TNT customer. Oh, okay. And if it blows up my hand or something, that's that's out. Oh. Right? <laughs> okay. That's going to happen like that. Uh, yeah, okay. Good. Uh, Thank you very much. I answered all my questions. They've, uh, so none of these um, are what they call projectiles. This is my favorite over here, the Inferno. I'm going back to that one for 1899 because that is the one that almost, I can't believe they still make it, almost blew your grandfather's hand off. So uh, the guys are very helpful, and uh, they're two big guys, so you don't want to you don't want to fuck around with them, that's for sure. Well, I'm going to not buy anything, especially for two ninety nine ninety nine, dollars 99 And, uh, Atomic salsa. That looks good. Okay. All right, man. Hey, thanks a lot. Yeah, no problem. My, uh, I'm recording this. My son's a comedian, and you're going to be on his show. Okay. You guarantee I'm not going to blow my hand up. Is that right? You see that? You see that one over there, that comb? They, they made them. They've been making them for 100 years. When I was a kid, my father reached down because it didn't go off, and it exploded. A foot from when he got there. But I'm glad to see they still have this stuff. So thank you. That's what I did. Okay, just joking with you. Oh, yeah, I know that. My prescription, that's why I got. He's a guy. Your guy's not happy with me. <laughs> not happy at all. All right, now we're back live with Dad. Thank you, first of all, for your special. You did a real investigative piece. Sound like you made some new friends, Dad. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, as you well know, Pete, being my son, this is the first in investigative uh, thing I've ever done. And yeah. I'm, I'm pretty proud of the work I did. Uh, yeah. I got in there. I, I really dug deep as well as deep as you could, <laughs> deep as you could go with fireworks. You know, yeah. it seemed it seemed that like you came off a little hostile when you said I'm taping you. I think he, he didn't. Yeah, quite... I know. I know. Yeah. It, it, it sounded hostile, but I was looking at the guy and, and he kind of struck fear in my eyes as I was watching him because uh, he wasn't he wasn't taking what I was saying kindly. Right. <laughs> I started, uh, I kind of chuckled with him and then I said, I think I get the hell out of here because now, these guys have got fireworks. You were telling me earlier that Uncle Tony, your dad's brother, your uncle, my great uncle, who I knew and loved, very, we were very close to them. He owned a, a small store, like a, a convenience store, a butcher shop in Amsterdam, New York. And you told me earlier that he sold fireworks uh, under the table. Is that right? Yeah, it was uh, highly illegal at the time. And uh, <laughs> uh, my uncle, your great uncle, uh, was a bit of a larcenist at heart. <laughs> and, uh, and he would do uh, a lot of stuff. We could go into other stories about Uncle Tony, but one of the things he did every year was sell fireworks. And uh, 
And every once in a while, he'd get a tip that the cops were coming, and he'd have to scramble out the backyard with boxes of fireworks that, uh, so he didn't get arrested. You told me that, <laughs> the, 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 somehow you must have gotten a tip, and you said that they would quickly put the boxes of fireworks in a car and then take the car yeah. somewhere. The cops would walk in yeah. and be like, hey, we heard you're selling fireworks, Tony. Yeah, yeah they all knew Tony. Yeah, they came in and say, oh, Tony, we heard you had fireworks here. And uh, they probably knew because their kids had them or something. You know, uh, it's like yeah. it was a small town. But uh, now, so they, uh, he, uh, that, what, that what, was, did he uh, what did he say? What did he say? Hey, I don't have any fireworks. <laughs> you know, what's he going to say? Oh, yeah, they're right here. No, he said, I don't have any fireworks. And, uh, and uh, you know, You've never been a fan. You you never, when we were growing up, you never bought fireworks and set them off. I do remember one time my friends brought over some bottle rockets, and I remember, I just remember vividly you running around with your shirt off, screaming, "Don't do that! Don't do that!" Do you re remember what yeah, happened? They, 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 yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big fan. What happened no. there? The only, I don't know what happened there. I, just, I, I don't like kids having bottle rockets that go off. You know what I mean? You know, yeah, they, we're they having a bottle like, rocket war. We were shooting them at each other. Did you know that? Well, yeah, that, that's fine. Well, that's okay as oh. long as you're shooting them at a target. <laughs> that's no a target practice yeah. is okay with a, with a bottle rocket. No, that was fine. I just thought you were shooting them up in the air aimlessly. You know. And finally, I remember when a when Ava was uh, young, uh, several years ago, she might have been, I don't know, six or seven, the neighbors invited us over. They were new neighbors. We didn't know them well, and they were doing a fireworks display. Yeah. And, and we yeah. went over there, and you were you were in town, and, and you went with me, as me, you, and yeah. Ava. And the guys yeah. started launching fireworks, and I remember yeah. you actually, yeah. you, you don't even like, yeah. you ne you've always been good, you and mom, about, you know, not telling us how to, you know, parent or step on our toes when we're doing something. In this case, you yeah. actually went... As far as uh, you grab the uh, yes. you grab the child and you removed, ran. I removed my my granddaughter from the scene of mm -hmm. a new neighbor you had who had uh, was a box of rocks for a brain. And I said, <laughs> I don't understand any of this that's going on here. So I said, Ava, uh, you would her. you like to leave? No, and you didn't. she said. Yes, Bob, Bob, I would like to go because I think this guy's got a box of rocks for a brain. <laughs> no, I think you and just then, uh, took her and, and left we me. Left the scene. Yeah, yeah, and you stayed for some reason. Well, he's my new neighbor. We, it was super awkward. You guys just, it, just yeah, ran no, away. It wasn't awkward at all because he had no <laughs> idea. He was clueless. That was fine. Uh, uh, all right, Dad. Well, happy fourth. Are you celebrating uh, or anything? Are you, is are you particularly patriotic these uh, on this day? Do you feel your jingoism really coming out and you know, kind of nostalgic. That's, that is a question I was not expecting. Yeah. Well, when we were growing up, you'd always have the whole family go out on the deck on July 4th and read the Declaration of Independence, right? Well, of course I did. We still do that. <laughs> you do? And, uh, oh, I, yeah. I, I, I've got it memorized. Is that right? It? Yeah, go ahead. You got the whole thing memorized. Go ahead. Go ahead. And then, uh, you know. And no, then do we, it. We, do the Declaration. We would talk about Star. Francis Scott Key and oh, right. the prisoners and how he was in the in the bay in Baltimore and yeah. watching the Francis Scott Key, the, the guy Empire. who wrote the national anthem, which is separate yeah. from yes. the, the declaration were glowing in the night. And That's the flag right. was still there. And That's right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, my dad, I happy fourth. That fort, you know, I, I was at that fort in Baltimore. I you know. believe that you were. All right. Well, we have to wrap it up. Thank you, dad. Love you. Happy uh, hey. fourth of July. All right, there he goes, proud patriot, Chisel D. That's my dad, and that was a lot of fun. And now let's have a serious conversation with my favorite historian, Kenneth C. Davis, who I have talked to so many times over the years. He's become a great friend and a great resource. I thought, well, it is Independence Day, and so let's do a special show and have a little history. We talked about... Gettysburg and the Civil War, as well as authoritarianism. I think I already mentioned this earlier, but you've got to go get all of his books. Don'tknowmuch.com. Don'tknowmuch.com. Follow him on Twitter and Facebook and all of the places. Uh, check out more about Ken in the show notes. His new book we mentioned at the end, great short books, a great read for the summer. Check it out. Let's do it right now. Professor Kenneth C. Davis, the best-selling author, Don't Know Much History and Books. Check it out, donutmuch.com. What better day to talk to you than uh, Independence Day, 4th of July, which we've done in the past. How are you? Good to see you. Kenneth C. Davis, everybody. I am well as well as I can personally be in these very, very 
confounding times, Pete. Uh, it's uh, been a, a difficult couple of weeks between, you know, Supreme Court and yeah. the other things that are going on in the country right now. Um, it's it's a discouraging time. It's a dangerous time. And I know people will want to say, oh, we've never been so divided before. But as we are going to talk about today, I think um, we've certainly been far, far more yeah. divided than we are today. Yeah, I want to um, talk with you a little bit about the, the Civil War, uh, specifically Gettysburg, that happened this time of year, July 1st through 3rd in 1863. But first, just a note on being the historian that you are and having the experience that you have when you watch precedent be overturned and having obviously an understanding of the history of the Supreme Court. What do you want to comment on or make mention of seeing a lot of these things that we thought were established be walked back? Well, it's it's a really good and really important question. And first of all, let me say I'm not a constitutional scholar, nor am I a lawyer. Um, I am a student of, obviously, the Constitution, a student of history, and I've always been interested in, of course, the the extraordinary changes that the Supreme Court is able to make uh, in American life. Many of those changes, especially in the last hundred years, uh, have been much for the better. Um, Many uh, before then were terrible. Uh, And certainly in the last few weeks and the last year, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, cases that uh, seem to do exactly what you're saying, upset what was held as settled law. And even some of these justices, as they were being going through their process of nomination and uh, Senate approval, uh, said, yes, this is settled law. But that was then and this is now. Um, Without getting into each of the very separate and very important cases, Dobbs, the abortion case, the affirmative action case, the um, uh, religious freedom case, mm. freedom of the speech case that involved uh, wedding, uh, wedding websites and uh, affirmative action. I, th- I think I mentioned that. So there have been some really, really important cases that have been decided, many of them by a supermajority of six to three. And I don't want to get into the merits of each of the cases because I think they're complicated. I think it's very important to understand that this is part of a much bigger picture, that we have seen a court that was in some ways manipulated by the way it was constructed uh, during the past few years, the addition of three very conservative justices Uh, A court that was manipulated to uh, suit a conservative, uh, a very conservative point of view. And it's the end game of a long, long history. This has been going on for a long time. Add into that what we've learned about the uh, several of the justices taking extraordinary gifts, trips, whatever, financial uh, uh, support from people who certainly had business before the court. Yep. In the past, that would have been deemed unacceptable. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when a Supreme Court justice had to uh, step down because he'd taken uh, some money and it wasn't anything that approached the level of what we're talking about. I'm talking about Justice Fortas during uh, Lyndon Johnson's administration, uh, a much lesser, uh, not crime, but certainly uh, un unacceptable for a Supreme Court to be de- de- dealing with such a thing. Now I did not seen, know about that. I don't think we've, I knew. We've seen the, the, all of the circumstances, the precedents of justices and how they should behave have just been blown away uh, by this current court. So it's, a, uh, and it is clearly the result of a very, very long and protracted attempt to uh, influence the uh, the courts, and th- by by all means, these people who did this um, played the system extremely well, and they had uh, obviously the assistance of um, people like Mitch McConnell in, in the Senate, who denied Barack Obama uh, a, an appointment to the sh- Supreme Court. Um, so th- these are really important issues. I want to say this though about uh, the the um, 
some of the cases in particular. Um, a lot of people look at the case and say, oh, this or that. Um, I don't think that it should have gone that way. Let me take, for instance, the affirmative action case. And sure. Again, I don't want to go into too much into depth with this. Uh, a lot of people will say, and I don't. Again, I don't want to argue the case, but I want to under, I want people to understand what the case is really about. The case is not about slavery. And people will say, "Why should my kid getting into college be punished for what happened 150 years ago?" Um, first of all, what many people don't understand is that affirmative action isn't just addressing what happened because of slavery. Affirmative action was addressing systematic racism at many, many levels in this country that in some ways still continue to this day. So it's not like this is some, a re redressing some grievance from right. 150 years ago or 300 years ago. When you look at things like uh, mortgages, the GI Bill, Social Security itself, uh, the redlining of, of districts, the educational system, the court system in this country, all of these things have been uh, weighed against minorities, black Americans and other right. minorities for a long time. That has nothing to do with slavery. It's the institutional racism that continued long after the Civil War ended in 1865 and then the passage of the Reconstruction Amendments that ended slavery and gave uh, black Americans the vote. The opposite, citizen, the opposite of which citizenship. the opposite of which you could speak to as well is the opposite of affirmative action uh, or a lot of people have been making this point that there's still incentives or uh, exceptions for the wealthy. I mean, that's always been the case, obviously, in this country that if you had if your daddy or your granddaddy went to the college, it means you're going to get those points. You're to get more consideration into that college as well. So there are these not only are there disadvantages for some Americans, there continue to be huge advantages, inherited advantages for other Americans is what I was trying to say. That's exactly that's exactly the case, Pete. And that's the case that a lot of people have been making. And so we'll see if the what the justices described in there. Uh, and, I, and I would really recommend that if you're interested in this stuff, the two the decisions in the affirmative action case were very clearly written and very clearly laid out. The two dissents in particular, I thought, were quite interesting because they did bring all this uh, history into. So if, if you only read a few court cases in your life, read the dissents in the uh, Harvard and University of North Carolina cases. They're very, very interesting, very, very instructive. But I, as I said, I don't want to get into the weeds of, of all this, but I guess the bigger issue with especially the affirmative action case is that it sp still speaks to how race has been part of this country's history from the beginning. And that there are certainly those in this country right now who would like to deny that history, yeah. to erase it from the history books. And we simply can't do that. So when we're talking about July 4th, we have to talk about what the role of slavery was in uh, 1776. When we're talking about the Civil War, we're not talking about some phony thing called states' rights. There was only one right that the states, the southern states that seceded were concerned with, and that was the right to continue taking slaves further west and continue to uh, keep slaves in their own states. Uh, and it was not a moral question. I'll, I'll make that clear right up front, too. Um, there were certainly people who objected to slavery on moral grounds, abolitionists, but they were a fringe element. The real essence of slavery in America in the 19th century was that it conveyed enormous financial power. It was America's biggest business, um, bo both being related to the cotton industry, which was enormous, and the fact that slavery itself was a business, because once the importation of foreign or African slaves was made illegal in 1808, that only increased the value of the domestic enslaved person, and especially women who could produce more slaves, mm. because an enslaved woman 
the child of an enslaved woman was also slave. So slave owners became slave breeders. It's, it's an unpleasant way to put it, but it became, that is true. Right. And that became an enormous business and built enormous wealth in this country. The second part of it was the political aspect. So it's financial power and political power. Why? Go back to 1787, the Constitutional Convention, creation of the electors to elect the president. Each state is given a number of electors based on their population. And that population was going to include enslaved people counted as three fifths of a person. Um, we think, oh, how horrible that was. But it was still an enormous advantage to the enslaved, uh, the, the states that enslaved people. For instance, Virginia was smaller in its white population than Massachusetts or Pennsylvania. But if you included the enslaved population, even counting it as three fifths of a person or 60 percent, it was the biggest state. That's how many enslaved people were in Virginia. What did that really mean? Well, it means that Virginia got the most seats in Congress and it got the most votes in what we now think of as the right. Electoral College. So five of the first seven presidents are slaveholders from Virginia. The two exceptions are John Adams and his son, John Quincy Adams. Uh, so this has represented enormous political power. And so more than just uh, I don't want to give up my uh, these people who work for me for nothing because it's kind of a nice life to have. This was financial power and it was political power. And that's why it wasn't going to end with any kind of compromise. And that's, of course, what brought us to April, eight, uh, April 1861 and the beginning of the Civil War. Yeah. Yeah. Before we get there, you've got this great series at your website, don't know much dot com. Uh, about the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence. What became of them? It's, a, it's an entire series uh, in, on the blog. It's fascinating. And I just, you know, I, for the sake of time, I just want you to, the, one of the main, I think, issues is around how many of them actually own slaves. But say what you will about this series and these 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence. Look, there's no question, Pete, that when we celebrate the 4th of July, we're celebrating something very extraordinary in not only American history, but human history. Yeah. This document was very radical in a lot of ways. It was radical to say that all men are created equal. It was radical to say that we are all entitled by nature to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It was radical, very radical to say that the government can only rule justly with the consent of the governed. This was at a time when most countries were ruled by kings, certainly England, France, Spain, most of the other uh, European, major European nations, powers of the time. And the Vatican, of course, had enormous power still, ruled by the Pope. So in all of these countries, through most of time, the consent of the governed has not been a consideration but Jefferson brings this idea, which others had put forward before him during the uh, period we call the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, uh, philosophers like Voltaire and Rousseau and John Locke, who worked, wrote the words life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson, uh, I'm sorry, the pursuit of property. Jefferson changed property to happiness for mm. the Declaration. And we're glad he did, I suppose. But these were very, very important radical ideas, and they have inspired people for nearly 250 years now. Uh, so I don't want to take anything away from the importance of that, nor do but, I want to take anything away from the idea that the men who signed their names to that document, and they pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, uh, to this ideal. That wasn't just poetry. They were really taking an enormous risk. Uh, if the king had caught up with most of them, they could have been strung up right away uh, for treason. So we can't undercut what they accomplished and the risks they took. They were enormous. On the other hand, uh, 40 of the 56 men who said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and all men are created equal uh, were either 
enslaving people or involved in the slave trade. Jefferson actually writes in his long list of condemnation of the King of England that the King of England is responsible for the slave trade, and he's not letting us Americans stop it. This was, of course, nonsense and propaganda of a sort, but it was taken out of Jefferson's draft version of the Constitu- uh, of the Declaration. Jefferson later said it was taken out in deference to the men who owned slaves, as well as the men who made a great deal of money transporting them. So this is the great American contradiction, that this nation conceived in liberty was also born in shackles. And 40 of these 56 men who signed this document and pledged their lives and their wealth um, were, were slaveholders and slavers. Um, I did go through all 56 of them on my website. It's a longer series, but, you know, I tried to just give a, a sense of who these people actually were, because history isn't just about the dates and the battles, as we've said before. It's really about the people who, who did this. So you can look at the uh, at don't know much dot com and, and read this, read through the stories of some of these um people and what they did, what they believed, and what became of them. Most of them are fairly obscure to, uh, to most of us, but some of them were quite fascinating and had a great deal to do with the founding of the country. Uh, remind me about Frederick Douglass's role and his idea about or his feelings around celebrating July 4th, because I, you know, I saw this video yesterday. Where was this video where people were asked their thoughts about July 4th? And, and it's a complicated feeling for a lot of people, especially as we started this conversation, looking at what the Supreme Court has done and, and, and our feelings about what this country has been involved with. Certainly even during our lifetimes, I think often about the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and that generation, this generation of veterans and what they've been put through. But what did... You know, Frederick Douglass, why did he refuse to celebrate July 4th? Well, it's a it's a famous, famous speech now. And uh, very often it's read around this time as well. It's the counterpoint to, you know, all the good feelings that we have. What I talked about, the rightful reason to celebrate the 4th of July as this extraordinary uh, document that talks about human liberty and our rights. Um But there was a counterpoint to that, of course, and it was about slavery. And in 1852, Frederick Douglass, who was born enslaved and then escaped and became the most prominent abolitionist of his time, uh, he was invited to give a speech on the 4th of July. It was actually the 5th of July because they didn't want to act. I think the 4th was on a Sunday that year, and nobody did anything on Sunday in those days. So Frederick Douglass in Rochester, New York, which was his home at that time, gives a speech which is now known to us as what to the slave is the 4th of July. And people were sort of his probably largely white, maybe moderate to progressive audience, uh, northerners, perhaps many of them abolitionists, were probably expecting Douglass to talk about the glories of the 4th and the glories of the founders. And he just issued a flat out excoriating denunciation of what these ideals meant while four million of his people were still in chains. And that is the essence of the contradiction that I've been writing about and talking about for a long, long time. Douglas said, we can't celebrate this Fourth of July while our people are still being raped and chained and beaten and whipped and killed in slavery. Um, So that was a a shocking moment, uh, certainly for the people in the audience. And it's come down as as one of the great speeches. Now, of course, I have to say also that we now celebrate, and I mentioned this on the website, and I've written about it for many years, we now celebrate Juneteenth a few weeks ago. Uh, It's now a national holiday. People still don't quite understand it. It was the day that the last People who were still enslaved in America, in Texas, learned that they were free. And it became this instant day of jubilation that became celebrated largely in the African-American community, largely in the Confederacy. But I've always believed that Juneteenth is something we should all celebrate because the end of slavery is a good thing. We should all be happy that slavery came to an end. And now the, the true meaning of the Declaration that all men are created equal, 
course, we have a long way to go to treating everyone equal, but at least now, in law, it was true. And of course, the constitutional amendment that, that would end slavery would come a, uh, a little bit later. Let's talk about that a little bit later. As I mentioned, I think I've said this on the podcast. Last week, I was giving a talk to young tribal nation uh, folks uh, from around the country at the Fish and Wildlife National Conservation Training Center, something I'm honored to be able to do for the last several years. And as you drive down there, you cross from Hagerstown just into the tip of West Virginia and you drive past uh, Antietam Battlefield. And so I had some time. I decided and I'd driven past many years before. and I said, you know, let me let me go in. And I got myself a guided tour, a personal just guided tour. I wish I could have. I wish desperately you were there with me. That would have been awesome. But it made me revisit and think about, of course, the Civil War, which we're, we're talking about. And you mentioned as we were scheduling this interview that, of course, Gettysburg took place July 1st through 3rd in of 1863 one of the most consequential battles where the most casualties and but turning point for the war and so that was happening during this week in 1863 and i thought we could talk a little bit about the history of that war you of course wrote a book don't know much about the civil war which i read so many years ago and then forget the next day so talk to me about gettysburg <laughs> and its significance Okay, Get uh, Gettysburg is a small town in uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, its significance was that it was a major railroad crossroads, and of course, the railroad was really for the first time significant in war in the American Civil War. And uh, controlling railroad lines was important to controlling territory, so on and so forth. Without getting into the tactics, General Robert E. Lee. Uh, brought his once sainted General Robert E. Lee, I, sh I might add, hmm. brought the no Army of Northern Virginia into Pennsylvania, attacking the unions, the Union states. Most of the war was certainly being fought, fought in the uh, Southern uh, or Confederate states. Uh, Lee took the attack into the Union. Part of it was to gain control of these uh, 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 railroads. Part of it was also because uh, Pennsylvania in that area had enormous uh, wealth of cornfields. And so he was going to feed his pretty starving army uh, with what they could gather uh, in Pennsylvania. And there was also the question that this would perhaps give him a straight line towards attacking Washington, D.C. Um, so without getting into too much of the strategy and the tactics, um, this was an, the, the furthest north that a Confederate army had ever marched. Uh, Antietam was also fought in what was essentially a, a northern state of Maryland, but this was even uh, more more northern and more frightful, uh, more frightening to, to northerners. Um, a three-day-long battle that went back and forth, bitterly fought uh, in these wheat fields and stony fields and rock hilly rocks, and at the end of it, uh, General Lee uh, was defeated and had to leave the field, uh, lost many men, uh, took uh, many wounded back with him on his retreat. Uh, there were questions about why the Union Army didn't follow up right away and go and destroy him while he was making his retreat. Again, that's for the armchair generals to debate. Um, but those were the questions that this was what was called the high watermark of the Confederacy. It was as, as close as they were going to get to accomplishing at least part of their goals by attacking the Union. And from July of 1863 on, uh, the, t the tide of war slowly, slowly turns, but it's going to be another uh, two years, practically a full two years of bloody fighting, uh, a lot of it in Virginia, uh, until the final defeat of the Confederacy. What else is important about uh, the defeat at Gettysburg or the victory, the Union victory at Gettysburg? Of course, a few months later, in November of 1863, Abraham Lincoln comes to Gettysburg. He's invited to make a few brief remarks, and he does. Uh, 
He delivers the Gettysburg Address, which in my mind and many people consider the greatest speech in American history. And it's only a couple hundred words. Read it, especially on a weekend like this, uh, when we're, we're thinking about American history, because Lincoln would say in this speech that the war was being fought over the ideals that were part of the founding in the Declaration, that all men are created equal. And he said this war is being fought to see if those ideals can survive. Um, so it's a very, very important statement on Lincoln's part, who had said from the very beginning that the war wasn't about slavery, which it always was, but now he was making it so. He'd already issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the enslaved people only in territories that Lincoln didn't control, that Union armies didn't control. They were only those uh, enslaved people in the Confederacy. So it actually freed very few people in uh, an actual sense. But it was a tremendous turning point, And the Gettysburg Address adds to this turning point moment. Um, I should add, not, not as famous as Gettysburg and maybe hasn't had any great novels and great uh, or good movies made about it. The very next day, July 4th, 1863, the city of Vicksburg, a city on the Mississippi River, uh, falls to uh, General Grant, who was not yet the supreme commander of the uh, Union armies. And that victory combined with Gettysburg really mean the war is moving in the direction of ending, even though it would be a long and very, very costly slog. Um, the fall of Vicksburg meant that the Union armies and navies had complete control of the Mississippi River. It really meant that the, the Confederacy was cut in two and that uh, a blockade that had been set up around the Confederacy to prevent cotton from going out to be sold, which their main uh, cash crop, and any ammunition or, or, or other supplies coming in, um, this really completed that uh, blockade and was uh, an important part, crucial part, in the uh, ultimate ending of the Civil War. I was watching some clips in anticipation of talking to you today and of, of the movie Gettysburg, and uh, General Lee, played, I think, by Robert Duvall, uh, at some at one point says we could end this war tonight if we win this battle. We could be in you know Washington tomorrow. What, what, was that that consequential? If, if the Confederates, uh, if Robert Lee's army had won uh, that day, would it have been over? Or was that inaccurate history or an over exaggeration at the time? That's one of those what ifs of history that is is kind of tenuous, and um, you can get a lot of arguments on that. Um, certainly, if he had driven towards uh, Washington or even captured Washington, what I suppose uh, is possible, even though it was extremely well defended at that point. Um, it may not have ended the war with a victory for the Confederacy, but it might have changed the terms of the outcome or it might have forced Lincoln to uh, to, to negotiate. It's impossible to say. I don't think based on everything else Lincoln said and did, that he would have capitulated. Uh, I think he would have been somebody who would, would say, no, we'll, we'll keep fighting until right. we, we win this because we cannot allow this country to be destroyed uh, by these uh, uh, treasonous states and these treasonous generals like Robert E. Lee. Um, so, no, I, you know, I think that's good drama uh, and maybe, uh, you know, good fiction, but I, I'm not sure if and you could get a, probably a lot of true military historians to argue that question better than I can. But I, I, I think it unlikely, given the extreme uh, supremacy that the union had in numbers of people, in wealth, in railroad cars, in manufacturing capability, uh, all of these things go into who wins a war, not just one general saying We'll march on Washington tomorrow. So I, I, I think it unlikely certainly might have altered the eventual outcome or the immediate outcome. But I don't think it would have changed the final ending of the war, which was of the defeat of the Confederacy. What 
what would, what did victory for the Confederacy look like? That's what I kept thinking as I was at Antietam and then watching these clips and thinking about talking to you today. Gee, that's a, uh, that's a, another difficult speculative question. Oh, what really? If, it wasn't like this. We want succession and we're not going to, you know, we don't need to take over the North. We just want to be left alone and be able to enslave people, et cetera. Yeah, except that, the, you know, that this was being fought and every piece of new territory that was being opened up in the western uh, part of the country. Right. Oh, right. Enor- we have an enormous uh, country that's at stake here that mm. is still relatively unsettled. California had really just come into the Union uh, after the uh, uh, Mexican War. All of those states that were created out of the land taken from Mexico after the uh, in treaty uh, taken from Mexico after the uh, Mexican War were contested. Places like Texas, the enormity of Texas, which was uh, prime cotton growing uh, territory for those men, largely men, who were understood that growing cotton exhausts the land. You need new land, uh, not only to replace the, the, the cotton growing fields that are getting tired, but if you want to keep growing more and more cotton, which is a very, very valuable commodity, the most valuable commodity in America at the beginning of the 19th century, you need more land and you need more labor and you need a lot of labor to uh, plant and harvest cotton. And so that's why slavery grew so rapidly in the early years of the 19th century, largely because of the demand for cotton. So uh, this would have been a conflict that continued as control of this rich, extraordinary entire continent was being fought over the next few years. Would, uh, for instance, uh, Southerners who uh, uh, wanted to move from Texas into Southern California have been satisfied that California was a free state and part of the union or where they they have continued the war there. So I, I don't think there's there was a simple end point um, without a lot of conflict for a long time to come. I did want to ask you one strongman related question. I'm sure you followed what's gone on in Russia with Putin and the war. I'm sure you probably know Yair Bolsonaro has uh, been uh, they passed a law that he can't run again for president for 10 years because of his election lies. And of course, you see that Donald Trump is the front runner in the Republican race for president. These are all strong men, I think, uh, by the way, you would categorize them. And I wonder what you think about as you see what is happening today currently with authoritarians as it relates to the history that you've written and know so much about. When I wrote Strongman, uh, which is now three, four years, when I wrote it probably five years ago, published it three years ago, um, the rise of the strongman seemed to be really with us uh, in a lot of countries, and of course, led by Putin or in North Korea. But you have people like the president of Hungary, just uh, not Hungary, um, uh, Turkey, just reelected. Erdogan, yeah. Uh, the prime minister of India w- just visited Modi, uh, who is characterized very often as an authoritarian leading to a strongman. Um, it's interesting to see this uh, this we're not quite sure yet what it was, this warlord uh, mutiny uh, in, in Russia. It had overtones to me of Mussolini's march on Rome, which mm. was mar- mostly for show. But in his case, Mussolini was sitting in his office in Milan while these men were supposedly marching on Rome and the The army wanted to just march out and stop them. But the king of Italy at the time uh, decided, no, instead, I'll let Mussolini have what he wants. Mm. Uh, A a very, very different outcome to a strong man pushing towards uh, a a capital. And uh, this this strong man, the Russian uh, uh, warlord, the head of the Wagner group, um, stands down. Mussolini is instead invited to become the prime minister of Italy in a very short space of time. Uh, 
Italy is a one state party under fascism and with with terrible repercussions. And Mussolini is so important because he did all of these things first. Hitler was in Germany right. watching what Mussolini did. Right. I just did. saw something. He idolized Hitler, really looked up to Mussolini until he didn't. Until he became far more powerful and right. Mussolini became his his second. Uh, and uh, that's a really interesting turnabout in, in world history because Mussolini certainly was first showed hit, uh, showed Hitler a lot of the the roadmap, the playbook for an authoritarian. And, and Hitler certainly used many of Mussolini's techniques. To wrap here, uh, something light, something that I am purposely trying to be very divisive over, uh, but maybe it's not the most important thing. Maybe you've got something on this. Maybe you don't. Uh, fireworks, sir. I hate them. It's one thing for your town to set them off that, you know, they're going to it's going to happen. But I I've made all the arguments. Listeners have heard it. But I don't know if there's any history of fireworks where they come from. Uh, but but or your personal opinion on them. But what are your do you have any thoughts at all? Because that's a theme all week that I'm talking about here. And I thought you would give some smart take. But maybe you'll be some pithy, petty, uh, divisive jerk like I am. I doubt it. Though. No, I I'll try not to be a pity divisive jerk like right. you. All right. But I, uh, I don't normally no succeed. But I'll there try. go my ratings. Um, fireworks have been around for a long time, of course. China, the Chinese really invented them, and they were meant as a celebratory thing. You, you hear fireworks talked about very early in American history. In fact, uh, uh, John Adams, when he actually thought we would celebrate July 2nd for an obscure right. reason, Congress had voted for a resolution that John, July 2nd was the day to become independent. Um, and he thought we would celebrate with bonfires and guns and illuminations, which were a kind of early fireworks. So they've been around for a long time. I've always personally enjoyed the big spectacle of fireworks. I understand also the people who really object to them as being, first of all, um, harmful to those who are suffering uh, yeah, veterans stress. and dogs and birds. No, and, and apparently, and you dogs, have disdain yeah. for no. no care of the for them, Davis. I I agree uh, that <laughs> that that's certainly an issue that should be taken into account, and I don't have a good answer for that. My immediate concern right now, and it was even more striking about two weeks ago when we had the first and more serious uh, smoke issue from the wildfires. Somebody was setting off fireworks. Uh, I think in New Jersey, it's uh, I'm in uh, lower Manhattan and it seemed like they were coming from New Jersey. And I was thinking, who on earth would set off fireworks in the middle of this caustic smoke we are having? It just seemed like <laughs> an extremely dumb thing yeah. to do. I, 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 you know, we're right now we've we've sort of passed through another um, a wildfire smoke a couple of days. It wasn't as bad as the last time. But I, I know what that acrid, uh, bad smell in the air after fireworks is. And, you know, uh, we're not going to get anywhere with this, Pete, I'm afraid. But, you know, if I said maybe we should rethink setting off these really uh, bad, smoky, noxious gases that l- linger in the air for a long time while we're not able to breathe, as well as the problems of, of noise and, and shock and, and awe that they lead to for other people. But um, I have a feeling we're not going to get very far. Well, you okay. might not join me on this mission, but I'm writing a book and started a nonprofit uh, to prevent people from uh, buying and sell, setting off fireworks at their own homes. And I, I, I you know, and I, and I make a big distinction between, you know, the Macy's. Yeah, that's spectacle. all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I, I, I anticipate no support on this movement of mine. Uh, and, I, and I would say a, there's, there's something place. else, which, there's, there's, there's something else, which is, you know, every single year we hear about somebody blowing off his hand, finger, yes, kid, yes, kid have, being blinded, yeah. people dying because of fireworks. They're, they're dangerous and, and, and foolish in the hands we'll, of fools. Uh, we'll so, talk about Darwinism uh, next time, however. <laughs> uh, thank you, as always, for being our professor. This was wonderful. It made me think of so many other things things i want to go off on so let's do it again very soon and i so appreciate you sir great to see you you know where to find me pete and people can find me at don't know where they'll read about oh. the 56 signers and 
Great Short Books. The yeah, latest. plug Great Short Books. I think it's a good time to, to go get uh, this book of yours, this latest book of yours for the summer. If you're going on vacation, this is such a great thing to bring. Great Short Books, a year of reading briefly. There it is. He's holding it up. Um, I'll, I'll briefly tell you what it yeah. is because it's meant to be brief. Um, I spent the pandemic uh, stressed out, sleepless, anxious like everybody else, and I decided to start reading fiction. And because my attention span was short, I started to read short novels. So I read about 58 short novels in the space of a year, and I wrote about them in great short books. And it's really a celebration of the importance and joy of reading, that it's not just escapism, that we get instruction, insight, uh, you know, ideas from these great writers uh, while still getting uh, escapism. I am a book reader. I'm not an e-reader. Uh, to me, there's Same. a, yeah. you know, a, there's a actual physical and physiological and psychological advantage to reading the book. You go back over the words. Um, so I'm a, a real advocate of reading, especially in this moment when reading is under attack in this country in the most dangerous of ways. Uh, again, by a very, very organized group, just as we, I said when we started talking about a very organized group uh, shaping the court, a very organized group is trying to eliminate books from our schools and our public libraries, right. yep. and it's a dangerous, dangerous thing. It is the kind of thing a strong man does, and so that ties it all together as well. Um, where they burn books, they will also burn people. Uh, that's a quote that is at the site of the Berlin book burning, which happened 90 years ago in May wow. of 1933. And people like Hemingway and Helen Keller and Thomas Mann uh, and a, a host of others were burned by the Nazis because they didn't like their ideas. Well, their books were. Their books were burned. It made you sound like the Nazis set Ernest Hemingway on fire. I think he did that to himself. He could have. Uh, they could have. They would have if they could have. Yeah, I, right, I suppose, right, right. You're right. right. I, 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 when I say <laughs> they burned Hemingway, I yeah. mean the works of yes. Hemingway. The uh, works of Thomas. Great Paul. short books. A great American. Kenneth C. Davis celebrating you and all the history that you've brought us over the years today. Thank you so much. Now go pursue happiness. Yes, indeed, we will do our best. Kevin, Kenneth C. Davis, everybody, don't know much, dot com. Of course, shout out to Chisel Day, my dad, for his special deep investigative piece. I hope you have a great, happy, safe fourth, and thank you for listening. Please sign up for a paid subscription, give a review on Spotify and Apple. And for those of you who stayed Till the end, a little special treat, you bumblebees. This is Jeff Daniels voicing the Gettysburg Address as Abraham Lincoln. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. 
it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people by the people for the people shall not perish from the earth.